Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries and today we have a special guest. He is the CEO of Transmit Security, Mickey Budai. Mickey, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aldor. It's great to be here. Yeah, man. We're excited to have you. This is the most, one of the fastest growing or more exciting security companies out there. But before we get into it, our audience is going to want to know what is Transmit Security and what do you guys do? Well, Transmit Security is basically an identity management company. So think about identity as everything from, um, you know, the, the moment you open an account or register for a website, all the way to authenticating every time you come back um, to authorization, all your permissions, and to making sure that no one is compromising your account. So all these and all the privacy aspects around it, all this is um, um, is identity management. And within identity management, we are really focused on solving the biggest problems that the market has today when it comes to cybersecurity. Is when identity meets cybersecurity, and one of the biggest problems is obviously passwords, um, you know, because they're bad and um, they, they are the uh, probably the cause for, um, it's not probably, they are the cause for more than 80% of all the attacks and the breaches that we're seeing today. No, that's a great point. Every time we see these big hacks go out, people talk about compromised passwords, how like the number one password people typically have is password one, two, three. Uh, <laughs> That, that's a common thing. Now, one of the things you talk about, and we've seen in all the publications on your business, is this idea of a passwordless authentication world that you guys are trying to move everyone towards. Let me ask you a question. Why is this such a challenge? Because you're not the only company working on it, but you seem to be the fastest growing one. Why is, give us a reason, why is password, why, why has the password stuck around since it's basically been around since the beginning of the internet? When the well, internet, it's, you know, it's been around for like the beginning of the internet, before the internet, actually. Well, first yeah. <laughs> it was the password, then came the yeah. internet, right? It's like, That's true. Uh, it's, it's been forever. And you, you really look at the, uh, the journey of the password. So it really started as something really simple, uh, right? It's like, um, you know, we all had like one password. If you look, go 40, 40 years back before the, uh, the internet, you only had one password. Um, and even with the beginning of the internet, you probably had one password. Um, and then it started to become really complex. You had multiple accounts, multiple passwords. Uh, we started to see compromises because passwords were really easy to guess. That was the first generation of attacks, right? Everyone was using, as you said, like, you know, one, two, three, four, whatever, uh, really simple passwords to guess. I, I still believe it's, uh, you know, I think like two or three years ago, there was a survey and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six was still the um, uh, the most common password um, <laughs> out there. Um, so uh, and, and then like everyone started to realize, OK, this is this is bad. So we need to put some constraints around the password. Right. So uh, started to like all these um you know, probably uh, rules that a password has to be at least six and then eight. Uh, characters long, right? It has to include capital letters. Uh, it has special to include characters. numbers, special characters, right? So it became really complex. And then you are not allowed to repeat your password. So you need to, do you remember that? You need to kind of like um, uh, choose a different password every like three months or so. Yeah. So people started to have like, you know, ways of, um, you know, thinking about how they can keep the same password, even though it changes every three months. So let's add like yeah, they uh, the yeah, they would yeah. add like a they would add like sequence counters to their own password. So like your password yeah. might be something cool like you know Blue Falcon two three four five, but then you'd be like oh one oh two oh three. <laughs> People yeah, start sequencing the, the, the their own password. Would be like you know if, if it's like you change a password four times a year, then you go one two three four, and then <laughs> uh, you know the year. So it's like one. 2020, one, two, 2020, and so forth. So uh, it, it still became really easy to uh, to guess these passwords. And then we started to see all these attacks starting from phishing attacks, right? It's like uh, phishing became a really big thing and still is a huge um, attack vector against, um, uh, against passwords. Um, and then we started to see compromises of large databases of, of passwords. And then what, what is called credential stuffing, which is like 
taking information you stole from one database and then because people reuse the same password across all their applications and systems then you start to uh, use that password across all these applications and compromise all the applications uh, belonging to the same user so it all became um, kind of like a, a really big uh, uh, problem for the password itself so organizations started to think what can we do next like you know how can we uh, other than you know all these constraints and all these rules um, around the password what else can we do and then came uh, the concept of two-factor authentication okay let's complement the password with something else uh, typically let's do you know it start it really started with um, knowledge-based questions if you remember right it's like um, you know uh, uh, you know what's the color of your car first car and uh, things <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that um, and, and it turns out to be like um, you know really um, a really silly idea you know for, for, for a couple of reasons first it's easy to find out the answers to that um, secondly people tend to forget what they actually answered for uh, these questions, right? It's like, what's your favorite song? I don't know, it changed, right? It's like, um, so uh, or really- you, or, or you just didn't type it in exactly. So like, uh, I remember one of my first questions was like, what's your first car or make and model? So it's like, oh, it's a Toyota Camry. But then did I put a space in it? Did I capitalize the T? Like you started to have like, or did I just write Camry? And then you're exactly. like, oh, I can't even pass my own security question because I don't really remember what I put in there. Even exactly. though I generally know my first car was Toyota Camry. I don't, but I don't know what I typed. <laughs> exactly. And many people actually made up answers. So when you, <laughs> you make up answers, uh, you don't remember them, right? It's like, what did actually I wrote about that? So um, yeah, it really was always painful and didn't work. Um, it then moved to, um, you know, I would say, uh, probably even today, you still see a lot of um, one-time uh, codes that are being sent to you over uh, typically SMS, text messages, yeah. um, or uh, email, right? So you log in with a password and then you get this text message with a code, you type the code in and uh, you get in. Uh, the problem with that is um, actually two problems. Obviously, in terms of user experience, once again, user experience became even worse. Like, it used to be really simple, like my password is the same password everywhere. It's like really cool, really simple. I remember it. Then I had like, you know, 200 passwords for 200 different accounts. And now I need to do this and also like, you know, start copying codes from uh, from my mobile phone. Uh, that's one problem. The second problem is that it was really, or still is very, relatively very easy for attackers to bypass two-factor authentication that is based on one-time codes. Especially and, if I steal your phone. Well, that's that's Super probably easy. the hardest way to do it. Uh, oh, the, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, the easiest way to do it is through uh, just, just the same phishing attack, right? It's like, oh, I'll, okay. I'll give you a real example, real example. So uh, do you have a Google account? I do. You do. Um, have you ever uh, gotten uh, an email from Google saying that um, we've seen you logging in from uh, a new device? Um, you know, this is the location. And, uh, you know, if it's not you, then please do something about it. Have you of seen course. that? Of you course. Yeah. So here's one thing that attackers are doing. So they're uh, building this very same email uh, message right, that looks exactly like this Google alert, and they would send it to you, all right? So uh, you would get it, you think it comes from uh, Google, but it actually comes from the attacker. There are many tools to do that uh, professionally. Um, so you see like, you know, someone logged into your account from uh, Tel Aviv Israel uh, right now, well, it's yeah. not me, right? It's like, you know, so <laughs> you got a link there to click on it and take action. So, you know, you're worried like someone just logged into my account. You click on the link, you actually go to the attacker's website, right? So you get to the attacker website, it look like, looks like a Google page with your username and password. You like you hurry up because someone is, is taking over your account. You put in your uh, username and password. Now the attacker has your email name, uh, email and password, right? So what the attacker does using an automated tool 
is immediately take the username and password that you've just typed in and try to log in with that to your Google account, right? So do, they do this in the background. What happens is that Google now really sees someone trying to access your account from Tel Aviv, Israel. All right, uh, Google sends you this uh, one-time code over SMS. So now you're getting this code over your, uh, your phone and you think that makes perfectly sense because you just now try to, uh, to log in, right? Um, now the attacker on the same website that you put your, uh, your email address and password is now asking for this code back. You put yeah. a code that just got in and then you, the, the automated tool uses that code to complete the process on their side. Now, what they actually did is that they just added the attacker's computer or device to your list of authorized devices uh, with Google. So now they can use that device to access your uh, Gmail, to access any of your um, uh, Google um, uh, services, and they don't need to go through this two-factor authentication again because the device is now known. The attacker's device is now known. So uh, you know the next thing they could do, for example, if you're using Chrome. Um, is to uh, look for all the passwords that uh, Chrome remembers for, uh, for, for your account. So yeah. you can actually go and look at all the passwords and they're stored, um, they're stored globally in the cloud. So from all of your computers, you can see all of your passwords for any of the accounts that you use through Chrome. And um, you, you get just a list of like, you know, probably 100 passwords that you're using across all these uh, all these applications. And now what's the next thing they can do? Now they control your email address. You don't even know that because they, they, they have access the same way you do. Um, and now they can go to any, um, any website that you're registered for, type in your email address, right? And then click forgot my password. What happens when they click forgot my password? The website sends them a one-time link to your Google account, which they have for access reset. to, right? Yeah. For reset, they click on that, they reset the password and now they have access. Basically your entire life is a mess just because you clicked on that alert that you thought is coming in from, uh, from, uh, from Google. Um, so that's uh, that's that's uh, kind of like an example on how easy it is to uh, compromise an account, and it all comes down to, um, you know, doing this enough. The attackers are doing this enough times um, in different ways until uh, you and all of us will basically, um, you know, at some point, will do a mistake and lose our uh, credentials. So that's why the uh, the problem of the password is 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 so big, and it's not just us as consumers, right? It's also us as employees. Yeah. Um, you know, by the way, when when they compromise uh, a personal account, a personal Google account, and they look at the passwords, some of these passwords will be work related, right? So this allows them to compromise other systems, and then. Uh, you know, move on. So this world is like, you know, the password, this is why the password is such a big problem. And this is why it needs to go away. Now, if you look at all the ways that we've tried to uh, to patch the password and, uh, you know, make it more secure. So two-factor authentication doesn't work. Uh, we just um, saw the example for it. And then the uh, the other approach would be, okay, like let's let's use all sorts of heuristics to understand whether the account is compromised. Um, so we'll look at the location and the device and the behavior and whatever to make a decision whether it's really you or someone else who um, accessed your account. The problem with that is that it's never accurate. It can be, um, um, it, it can be like, you know, if, even if you do detect it, what do you do about it? Like, do you block the uh, the access for the user uh, because there is, um, you know, low, a very high rate of false positives and false negatives? So, what mm. what do you do about it? So, it goes back to you'll you'll just do two factor authentication with an OTP, and you know, we're back to the same problem. So, so 
so I got I to gotta tell my story because my phone, I was signed up to one of the beta versions of uh, an operating system, which was a bad idea. Some of my applications really didn't work, so I decided to wipe my phone. Now, unbeknownst to me, I had a two-factor authentication app. Uh, they, the A lot of the companies that like you mentioned, they now require or ask that you have a second, um, basically a third-party 2FA app. Well, I didn't realize that if you wipe it, that there's no way to get all your old codes back or re-authenticate your new 2F actor authentication app back to, I just assumed it was like all the other um, platform services where I would just get my, reinstall the app, I'd be back to my account, I'd be on my way. So I had to, for the US government, I had to go file for a new, The by the way, for those of you who don't know, if you lose your 2FA account for TSA PreCheck, you will have to just delete your account. That's literally their recommendation. Delete your account and start over. So I did that. Um, Coinbase was my uh, crypto bank. I had to submit my authentication, doc, like my driver's license. I had to submit all kinds of stuff. And they do it via web browser so they can get it at the time of request so that they know that it's you just to unlock my 2FA. So 2FA, as you said, a lot of gaps there, right? Operating system damage, which told me if I had if I had done something innocent, like drop my phone, I'd be locked out of everything, right? And so this device, as powerful as it is, it's also quite fragile. We all know that these devices crack, get damaged, get wet. You you know this. Like this is not full foolproof either. So yeah. how are you guys approaching this problem? I, I'd love to understand the difference with tra- what is, how is the transmit methodology. You actually touched the, uh, the, uh, the, the the big problem with going passwordless. So, you know, you can go passwordless in multiple ways. So, for example, these these authenticator apps, um, you know, could log you in without passwords. So they could, for example, leverage the biometrics of your phone, right? It's mm-hmm. like either fingerprint authentication or face recognition. Obviously, uh, with biometrics and... Um, uh, the fact that biometrics is now embedded in most devices, uh, definitely all the uh, new generation of devices include some kind of biometric reader and uh, very reliable biometric readers, by the way. Uh, yeah. Biometrics is probably the easiest way to uh, to go passwordless. Um, so we, we all do that with our mobile applications. Many of our mobile applications support uh, biometric authentication. So instead of like logging into the bank with a password, you log in with your fingerprint or face. Um, obviously, unlocking the phone itself is done with, uh, with biometrics today. And we got um, laptops supporting biometrics and we now got uh, tablets supporting biometrics. So this is probably the most, uh, the, the best way to replace passwords. But the problem here is exactly what you experienced, which is biometrics and applications are tied to a specific device, right? So if you register your biometrics on your mobile phone, you register your biometrics on your mobile phone, not on the application that is installed on your mobile phone, the biometrics are part of your mobile phone. They're stored in your phone. They never leave the device, right? So for those of you who don't know how it works, there is actually a coprocessor inside the uh, the device that is used just for security purposes. And that is the hardware that stores the information like your biometric information. So when the sensor, like, you know, whether it's a face sensor or a fingerprint sensor, when you use that, that information goes to this uh, 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 specific hardware and it does the comparison and uh, basically it releases uh, or unlocks the phone or unlocks the application or whatever it is that you're, you're trying to do. It never leaves the phone. So it means that if you lose the phone, if you, um, you know, wipe the phone, if you delete something on the phone, the biometrics are gone and your ability to authenticate with biometrics or with a specific application, even without a biometrics are just gone. And you take another device and now no one knows anything about you, right? It's like, you, you, need, <laughs> yeah. to, you need to fall back to something. So you mentioned like, with a TSA, you had to fall back to scanning your, um, you know, identity card, driver license, whatever. So you need yeah, to they made me, they made me reapply completely. Yeah, reapply. So like, or, or. <laughs> I had to reapply to my TSA account because 
Um, they said the only option was to delete your existing account and start over. And I was like, what? And like they said, when you start a new one, it'll see that your old one isn't authenticated to another account. So, But it took a while. I mean, that, that's kind of like what you're saying. It's not instantaneous. This is a process and it's a manual process. You can tell. You have to submit paperwork, application, sign things. Like, come on, man. Like it took a while. <laughs> All right. Uh, so a lot, a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of applications, what they do is that they just keep the password in the background. Okay, so, um, you know, perhaps we'll allow you to uh, to register your biometrics on, you know, on a device and use your biometrics to log in. But, uh, you know, if you lose the phone and you get a new phone, then use your password and then re-register your biometrics. The problem with that, there are two problems with that. The first one is that everything we said about a password in terms of security still applies. Right. It means that if I go and steal your password, I could go from a brand brand new device, um, you know, and log in with a password, and then even as an attacker register my own biometrics to log in yeah. your uh, into your account. So as long as the password is there, uh, in terms of security at least, we uh, we haven't done much. Right. It's like oh, we, we actually made it worse um, because, um, <laughs> you, you know, if you use your uh, biometrics on your mobile device for like six months, 12 months, whatever it is, and now you get a new phone and they ask you for a password, do you will, will you remember your password? Most likely I mean, not. Most right? likely not. Like, I mean. Yeah, you haven't used it for uh, like 12 months. Like, who knows what <laughs> it is? So, um, you, you know, the problem is now that you need to recover or like, you know, go through whatever forgot my password process they have and hope that uh, the email address or the phone number or whatever it is, is, uh, is accurate, is up to date. And, uh, you know, you can actually go and recover the account. So you've made the, uh, the problem actually worse, both in terms of security and the, uh, the customer experience. So in order to go completely passwordless, what you need to do is to be able to transfer trust between the different devices that you have. Right. So like each one of us have, um, you know, we have a mobile device, we have a computer or a laptop, we probably have a tablet. So, you know, anything between two devices, four devices, whatever it is, depending on how tech savvy we are. And then every, um, you know, every, um, you know, probably 12 months to, to 24 months, we get a new device, whether it's a new phone or a new tablet or a new uh, or a new laptop we should be able to transfer the trust that we have on one device to uh, to all the other devices. So if this device knows who I am and now I have a new laptop, I should be able to register the new laptop based on my mobile device. Makes perfect sense because now I transfer the biometric trust that I have on one device to another device. And now I can uh, continue to work with with a new device, right? So kind of like, you know, building a network of my devices and everything that knows me to be able to do this recovery um, in a very, uh, very easy way. And if I buy a new phone and I also have my old phone with me, I can just transfer the trust very easily from these two phones based on just biometrics instead of going through all these processes. So now we got to dive into the magic question, which is how does the transmit work? How, what is unique about how you're doing this? Because we did our homework on you. I'm looking at a Forbes article actually right now, published June 22nd, 2021. For those of you listening who aren't familiar with Mickey and his company, Transmit Security raised a $543 million Series A, the largest ever for a cybersecurity company, according to Crunchbase. Um, it was announced on this date, June 22nd, 2021. So... Obviously, a lot of investors see the future with what you are accomplishing or attempting to accomplish at Transmit. And you're a veteran in this space. You have worked in cybersecurity of some way for quite a bit. You were part of companies before Transmit as well. What is what is the groundbreaking methodology that you are deploying at this moment that is transforming this passwordless authentication future? Give us an idea for those. Because, you know, we all understand. I think everyone listening now knows the password pain. It's like we've all experienced it. But we haven't experienced what you're potentially offering. What what is it that Transmit yeah. is bringing to market? Because this is what's fascinating. Right. So in terms of uh, going passwordless, 
Um, it's actually, we, we used to have like, uh, you know, probably an account, right? And then you had a password to that account. Very simple yep. connection. Okay, so every time the user comes in, regardless of the device, it's like, what's the password? Um, is it the correct password? Uh, let's get the user in. Now what we have is we have an account. We have different devices that the user has and you need to recognize each of these devices. You need to bind each of these devices securely mm -hmm. and be able to, or allow the user to authenticate with biometrics with each one of these devices. Now you also need to be able to allow the user to authenticate with one device to get access from a different device. So for example, I go and I want to use my computer or you know what, I want to use your computer to log into my, um, you know, my, my bank account, All right? So I can use my phone, the biometrics on my phone to log into your computer to my bank account and do that without a password and do that in a very secure way. So it's like this multi uh, devices um, uh, ability to work across multiple uh, devices. And then comes like, okay, understanding which, uh, which of these devices are actually mine, which are devices that I've used, um, you know, like shared devices or uh, even public devices and then understanding all the connections, all the risk around it, and making sure that I always authenticate in the easiest way, whether it's the biometrics on, on the computer itself, whether it's through my the biometrics on my mobile device, and I always do this um, securely and in the fastest way possible. So, you know, the, the technology around it is understanding all the devices, all the linking between the devices, the ability to transfer the session between devices um, and um, uh, identifying all the risks that are associated with that and mitigating them at runtime, uh, very, uh, you know, basically behind the scene without the user understanding or, or needing to know what's going on. How does that how does that mitigate what you mentioned earlier in the conversation about like let's say for example someone internationally has somehow fished your password right and they set up their device as part of the authentication how does transmit prevent that from happening because you don't have a password so oh, yeah. <laughs> the old thing about transmit is that we allow you as an organization to go and delete all the passwords for all your users all your customers all your employees like you just go and delete it. There is no password option. Like even if you ask me, what's your password and you give me a password, that's not a password because there is no password. Okay, so <laughs> the, the hard part about innovative things is when you don't have any reference of it, it's hard to imagine. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I feel like right now, I am the guy that was riding a carriage and Henry Ford says, I can sell you a car. I'm like, what? I got a carriage and horse, right? I feel like the guy with the carriage and horse because all I know is what I know. I don't know what you know, right? So how, how does this work? So like, okay, wait a second. I, I, I work at a new company. Let's say I walk into Transmit Security. I get a job with you. I'm, um, you know, I'm like a, in business development. So I'm going to need access to the intr whatever intranet communication systems you guys use. I'm going to need access to a CRM that you guys use. I'm going to need ask, you know, access to like a knowledge base that you guys use to like know my products. How do you log me into all these things? Do you just, right. the day I show up, you're like, hey, put your fingerprint on this and it's going to start authenticating? I, how does this work? Pretty much. So uh, the, the first the first step is identity verification, and you kind of mentioned it with the uh, with the TSA, where you need to scan something. It's like you know verifying your identity for the first time. So we yeah. would take like a driver license. We would take whatever uh, knowledge uh, we have about your identity, your uh, you know phone on record, and all that to establish your uh, initial identity. That's the first time registration. If you uh, if you're in an office, this could be like like, you know, even a physical uh, verification of, um, you know, who you are. And then once you do that, you, you go and like, you know, you scan a QR code, you register, like devices automatically register, your biometrics is, are, are automatically registered. And uh, the biometrics on the device are now attached to your identity, like your corporate identity, for example, right? Once you do that, 
you can go to any application you have, um, you know, authorization to uh, to use. And uh, whenever you go to uh, to the application, um, you know, from from any device, you you'll get a you know QR code. You scan the QR code. You authenticate with biometrics on your mobile device. The identity, like your identity, your corporate identity, is released to uh, to the application, and the application lets you in without a password. Now, if you do this from like your laptop, you just got a laptop from um, fr- from uh, from the organization. Um, you do this from the laptop, and it recognizes that this is your personal laptop, and personal laptop uh, supports biometrics. It will automatically register the biometrics on the laptop itself. So the next time you use the laptop to go to any of the um, you know corporate applications, all you need to do is to use your finger or face, and you get in. You don't need to use your uh, your mobile for that. So now you have like two devices registered under the same account. And you can use each one of them to uh, to log in with biometrics. That's 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 how it works. It's very simple. Like in terms of user experience, all it takes is just like you know, just one biometric scan and you're in. Okay, I'm I'm fascinating by it's I'm fascinated by its simplicity because I'm looking at by the way when you said how we live in a password overburdened world. I opened up my personal budget. It's on the second computer. No one's been seeing it right now, but I looked at it. Um, my house, 42 accounts. Straight, <laughs> I'm looking at 42 accounts right now, right? Cable, banking, utilities. You add it up, 42 accounts, which I probably don't even have that many. Of. There's probably people with even more than 42. I just happen to have 42. Right. Give me an idea. So, like, you know, the, so I'm really fascinated by this. So, how does, so you mentioned like the reason why it mitigates phishing is because if you were, if, Let's assume everyone used this technology, like you mentioned Google, Apple Pay, because I've definitely gotten that. So the the hack, the fish I got was even more nefarious than what you said, which was unauthorized charges on your, I'm like, oh, wait a second, wait a second. I don't want to pay for that. Like log in, we got some unauthorized charges. So now I have to hover my cursor always on the sender and be like, you know, it's like from at the apple.com. Like, what's that? So I know that's fake, yeah. <laughs> right? So in, in a world where you're talking about, you're saying, hey, listen, the reality is most devices, the, 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 the biometric data is stored on the hardware. It's never stored in the cloud. And therefore, when someone, if, if uh, let's say Apple, Google, if they used a transmit security type function, when I use my biometric scan to log into my account, the reality is that data is never transmitted to the requester. It's not possible because this data is secured solely in the hardware of the device. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. The, the way it works, like technology wise, is that uh, basically um, we're, we're using cryptography between uh, the device itself and the uh, the server side. Right. So you don't store um, you don't store biometric data, you store uh, keys. You store uh, cryptographic keys. Um, mm-hmm. you know, the way it works um, is that on the device itself, the hardware that um, stores the um, uh, your biometric information, when you register the uh, the device for a specific service or a specific application, it generates a pair of keys, a public and a private key. It stores the private key it passes the uh, public key to the application. Now the application has the public key uh, for the private part of it. And then when you actually try to authenticate, what happens is that the application generates a challenge and it then passes the challenge to the, um, uh, the device itself. The device itself does the authentication, which releases the private key on the device or in the device itself, and then uses the private key to um, uh, to sign the challenge, right? And then the signed challenge is passed to the service side. Now the service side uses the public side of uh, that key to verify the challenge, that the challenge was actually properly signed. And this guarantees actually that the biometrics that were used in order to unlock the private key, okay, actually 
completed this, the uh, the process that was ver verified by the service side. So if someone actually hacks into the service side, what they get is uh, just a bunch of public keys, and they're public, right? It's like uh, that's that's the old concept of public no match. key. Yeah. And if they actually want to um, to be able to authenticate or steal your um, you know, anything that has to do with your biometric identity, they have to uh, break into the phone itself, into this, um, you know, hardware on the phone and be able to extract from that uh, the private key or any information that allows them to um, impersonate you. So in the event of theft, because you've already authenticated other devices, the whole goal would be, hey, you know, your thing's been, you know, your let's say your hardware has been stolen, you log into one of your other devices and immediately report it as yeah. authenticate. So because, there's not enough time basically. Right, because you have control over uh, your devices, like, you know, you can actually go and see with Transmit, like this is all, these are all my devices and I can revoke this device. I can use any of my devices to log in and see, um, you know, all the other devices and revoke, um, you know, a specific device. Regardless, it's very, very hard, um, almost to the point that it's, um, in, you know, it's a, it's kind of like almost impossible to actually go and break into devices and extract these private keys, at least today. And if you want to do this at scale, you need to go like, you know, if, if it used to be you break into a database, you get like, you know, one million, five million uh, passwords and you just walk away with them. Uh, now you need to go and break into 5 million endpoint devices. Um, <laughs> extract, extract the, the information from each one of them. Before it gets reported stolen, which yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. that's that's crazy. The, you know, when you, when you think back to your career, you've been in security for quite a while now. When did you start thinking that this was a possibility? I mean, we understand that Transmit started, it looks like in 2014, and you had sold another company uh, another company trustier to IBM in 2013 like when did you start seeing like this is a this is a possibility this is the new way we can authenticate devices to make a passwordless future because when you the way you're talking about I can't wait for this to get to consumer applications like right now it looks like it's just for b2b stuff like yo can my like I'm already thinking can my iTunes be like that can my Google Play Store can be like that can can everything be like that so I don't cuz I'm tired of passwords too like I'm like everybody else nobody and I'm guilty some of my passwords are the same. I will say that all my utility passwords for anyone out there, all my utility passwords are the same, not any of my financial. So if anyone wants to break in and pay my utilities, help me out here. <laughs> but, but, but you know what I mean? I think all of us as consumers on the consumer side, we're frustrated with passwords too. How do you, I'd love to hear like, when did you start thinking of this? How do you see it scaling or does it, is it going to come to consumer side? I'd love to hear your opinions on this stuff. It, it, it's definitely coming. Um, so if anyone is listening and is the owner of a consumer application, the technology is here, the technology is ready, you can integrate it, you can go passwordless within weeks. The technology is here and it, actually I would say it's, um, you know, it, it's it's really ready. I mean, there, there is this curve until like, you know, people actually start to adapt something new, but, uh, but it is ready. Uh, Microsoft um, um, is using passwordless technologies now with specifically with Microsoft accounts. Uh, the technology is, um, is ready and should be integrated into any consumer facing application. In terms of when we um, actually understood that this is the uh, the next big thing. This was actually when we were at Trustier. And what we did at Trustier was, uh, well, basically fraud prevention. We were, uh, we, we had this uh, um, system that identified compromised endpoint um, devices, um, compromised with malware. And uh, we were able to alert the uh, uh, the different service providers, the different application owners that the endpoint device is compromised and they should be, uh, you know, really careful about uh, wh whoever is trying to log in from this device. But we've realized that, um, you know, th this is just another patch to, uh, to the problem because um, and a compromised endpoint would usually typically result in 
compromised credentials because the malware that sits on your uh, endpoint device on your computer would wait to see and like wait for you to enter your credentials steal these credentials and allow the uh, the attacker to log in from a different device um, so we realized that this is just another patch to uh, to the problem. And then in 2014, I, I, I think uh, this was the uh, uh, the first uh, Touch ID release of uh, of Apple. And um, even though there were like you know biometric readers before that in some laptops like Lenovo laptops and others that included biometric, and I, I believe that. Um, Samsung had a biometric reader on their devices uh, before uh, before Apple. But when Apple came out with Touch ID, the uh, the real difference was the user experience, right? The user experience of Touch ID was completely different than uh, the previous generations of um, fingerprint readers. Like if you remember, the previous configurations were like you had to swipe your uh, <laughs> finger very slowly until it actually reads the finger. And it was like very um, cumbersome um, user experience, but with Touch ID, it all changed. And when it changed, we realized that the technology is ready and it's just a matter of time until it's incorporated into all devices and it's going to change the world in terms of our ability to um uh you know to fight back um account uh takeover so that that was like you know the moment we realized that we need to focus on that no, it is amazingly fascinating. For those of you who have not done your homework we've done a little bit for you Mickey is like you said he was co-founder of Trustier. He developed this idea and thought while he was in Trustier. Obviously, here we are today with Transmit. You're also an angel investor, a serial entrepreneur. This guy is the jam. If you want to read more about Mickey, I would just say Google him. Uh, there's a lot of articles about you. Super fascinating stuff. Mickey, I want to say thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. But before you go, before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The Lightning Round is brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Mickey, this is where we ask you questions outside of the realm of work so our audience can get to know you a little bit better. You ready? Yeah. All right. Got to ask, what was your favorite subject growing up in school? Wow. Has to be <laughs> math, you... <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, yeah, Matt. When did you realize for yourself that, hey, you were going to possibly start your own companies? You know what? The first thing that I started was when I was. Uh, that's my what my parents told me when I, when I was six. I started like you know an insurance company for my family. Wait, and what? <laughs> wait, back it up, back it up. Six years old, man. I was six eating paste. Old. I, I was eating paste and glue. Like I had to be told not to eat paste and glue. So, You're starting insurance companies. Yeah, we, we, we had a neighbor. Um, he was like an insurance agent. And I, I went to see like, you know, my, my friend and this was his father. And I, I like um, I was like, OK, I can do this. And, uh, you know, I, I started to collect money from uh, from like, you know, family members and started like, you know, kind of like a small insurance company to. So th this was like, you know, I guess I always knew that I want to do something by by myself and to be an entrepreneur. So one of the things we often hear about entrepreneurs is they hear they get motivation from their life or like they encounter problems. What were some of the things that got I guess motivated you towards a tech centric career? What were you? Uh, what were some like big changes in your life that made you like, oh man, I'm going to go down this path? Well, look, first I I got my first computer when I was nine. Um, so, uh, like my grandfather brought it to me, like, um, uh, as a, as a present, as a gift for my birthday. And, uh, you know, I started playing with that and, uh, you know, ever since then I was, uh, like, you know, I was, I was programming for, you know, until I, uh, I, I graduated from, uh, from high school. So I always knew that I'm going to do something around, um, um, you know, around computers. And, um, you know, I got into um, to the Israeli, Israeli military, went into a cyber unit. So this is when I knew that cyber is really fascinating. And this is something that I want to do for uh, for the rest of my life. Um, so all of these kind of like came together. And, um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of uh, problems while I was or challenges while I was in the military. So I knew that there, there are a lot of, um, you know, challenges to uh, to solve. 
Um, and when I uh, got out of the military, um, I immediately started my uh, my own business. And since then, I, I've, I've done like three different um, uh, or co-founded three different companies. Yeah. Uh, for those of you guys not keeping track of Mickey, this guy's incredibly successful. The trustier company, which you mentioned earlier, we saw it as public record. It was sold to IBM for a billion dollars in 2013. You come right around turn and start um, transmitting in 2014. I got to ask you, what keeps you motivated? What keeps you hungry? What 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 fires you up the most? Well, look, the uh, the technology constantly evolves. It's like, uh, you know, new challenges and new opportunities, um, you know, all the time. So that that's what keeps me uh, motivated. If it was like the same thing over and over again, like, you know, if I had to do another company that does exactly what a previous company did or, you know, trying to solve the same thing, um, I, I wouldn't be interested. I'm, I'm interested in solving problems. And as new problems emerge and new technologies emerge to solve these problems, this is what drives me. This this like, you know, what motivates me. Awesome. And then we got to ask, you know, when you're not developing since you've been, it looks like you've been, you know, very compelled and moved by technology and innovation since, like you said, since you were uh, given that first computer. What do you do for fun outside of the world of tech? Do you do? <laughs> uh, yes, a sport and eating. Uh, so, um, you know, I do a lot of sport, uh, swimming, um, rope jumping, uh, gym, um, you know, skiing, whatever. And, uh, you know, I go to a lot of restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got to ask for that one recommendation. What is your favorite? If, if someone were to visit you in Tel Aviv, where's one place you think they just got to eat? Um, so I'll just uh, name a couple. So uh, one of them is uh, Sheila. Uh, it's a great restaurant in Tel Aviv. The other one is Turkey's. Um, it's, uh, it's another one. These are just two out of, uh, many, many, uh, great restaurants in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Well, listen, Mickey, I enjoyed having you on the show today. Thanks for sharing your vision for passwordless future. It sounds like it's not even the future. It's present. We just need all it the other companies present. to get, get on board right now, because okay. if you're listening and you had the same problem I've had, that you felt the pain. But 2FA is not good enough if you were to lose your device or get it wiped for whatever reason. The legwork to go get it unwiped is a problem. Like you, you probably don't think about that until it happens to you. But Mickey and Transmit Security here to solve that. Mickey, thanks for joining us today on IT Visionaries, man. It was a lot of fun hearing your story. Thank you, Albert. It was really fun. Nice talking to you.